our first meme. And you know what? This is true. A church that does not call out false teachers soon will invite false teachers because they're not brave enough to stand up against truth, and they aren't. And you have to stand up to truth. Now, when I, they say call out false teachers, it doesn't mean that every time you get up, you have to name names, okay, and, and tear down other people. But sometimes you do have to name names because these are the prominent um, guys in the pulpit today, and people have to know about this stuff. So you don't do that in necessarily a hateful manner. You do it in a manner of teaching, instructing to help us with our discernment. So there's a verse that is a very good verse that we need to understand. And that is Romans 16, verse 17 and 18 says this. Now I beseech you, brethren, Paul is saying, now I beg you, brothers and sisters in Christ, mark those who cause division and offense. Mark, mark those means like put a stamp on them so you know who they are, so that you see who they are. Mark those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, doctrine is teaching, which you have learned and avoid them. In other words, if somebody comes to your church and they start teaching something than that you've been hearing, what is that going to cause? It's going to cause a division. Because if somebody's teaching something, this half of the church may say, well, I believe, agree with that guy. This half of the church may not. And that's how you have church splits. And so Paul says, mark them. So be aware of this. Be careful. So if there's anything like that happens. For such as they serve not Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. In other words, their own belly, their own flesh, their own pride. People get stuck on pride and they just want to push what they believe without really having proof for it in the Bible, and, and sometimes that happens. But their own belly, and by good works, good words, and fair speeches. Notice good words and fair speeches. They sound good. They're saying things like, hey, this should be believable. And fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. The simple are those that don't have a lot of discernment, especially younger Christians. And the truth is, there's an awfully lot of younger Christians today in Christianity, because most Christians go to church and they don't get fed Bible doctrine or teachings, so they basically will fall for anything. You know, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything, right? And so that's the truth. So you have, it says here, mark those. Now, mark those means to take heed of these people and to take heed. Be aware of these people, who they are. So if I name a name, I'm not saying I'm better than that person and tearing that person up. I'm trying to expose what they're teaching because little by little, that stuff goes in your ear and you start hearing, you start hearing, you start hearing. Pretty soon you may start believing that stuff too. So you have to be careful. So I have to do that whether it offends people or not. I have to stand for the truth. And so I'm going to do that. But it says avoid there. Also, avoid means to deviate from. In other words, shun. Now, let's say there's somebody that came to your church and they started teaching something wrong and, you know, I had to confront them and they left. They never came back. Does that mean you don't ever talk to them? No. If you see them on a street, you say hi to them. Ask them how they're doing. It just means don't fellowship with them in a spiritual sense because that's the wrong thing to do. You should avoid them in that sense. Okay, it doesn't mean you can't say hi to them, you can't ask them how they're doing and so on. It means you does, don't run the other way. Just be very careful about letting them try to get in your ear and convince you of stuff, okay? So that's what you have to understand. Okay, so the next verse here is Revelation 2.20. Now we're going to notice here, I'm going to go through some of these verses, the Bible names names. Notwithstanding, Revelation 2.20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you. Because you suffer that woman Jezebel. Now Jezebel, I don't believe that was her real name. I believe that was her nickname. Now it could have been, but I don't know if there's a lot of people that were called Jezebel. So most people, that was what they referred to as Jezebel. After Ahab, who's going to call their daughter Jezebel? Just like, how many kids do you name, know named Judas, right? <laughs> Not too many. But it could have been. We don't know that for sure. But it could have been kind of a nickname too, calling their Jezebel. Who calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication eat things sacrificed on the idols. So this woman, lady in the church, was teaching things that were wrong, getting people to do things that were carnal, and so on. And so he said, that I have a few things against you, Church of Laodicea, there in 2.20. Not no Thyatira, right? Yeah, Thyatira. Okay, so then the next verse. 1 Timothy 1.19 and 20. Paul told Timothy, Hold in faith and a good conscience, which some, having put aside, have suffered shipwreck, Concerning the faith. It's like destroying their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blasphemy. So notice names. Hymenaeus and Alexander were named as names. So it had to be pointed them out so people know, these are two guys, watch out for, look out for. So he mentioned their names. Now, I'm not saying these guys were unsaved. I'm not saying that at all. 
It doesn't say that. They may have been saved and been, been teaching false things. But he turned them over to Satan for um, that they learned not to blasphemy, to speak out things that were wrong, okay? So if you look at that in 1 Corinthians 5, 5, remember the person that was having a relationship with his uh, stepmom? He was turned over to Satan for the destruction of flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day, day of the Lord Jesus. So Christians can get mixed up into false teaching. And I've saw, seen that in my life many times. They know this gospel, they got saved, and that you heard their testimony, but they get mixed up. And sometimes that happens. Satan, is, Satan isn't just trying to destroy the unsaved. He's already got them in their back pocket. He wants to destroy Christians. So be aware of that and understand that. He wants to destroy you in the sense that you have no testimony, you have no witness, that people look at you and say, that guy's a Christian, and look what they're doing. So understand that. People look at us, and we're to be a light. Okay, so name, two names were mentioned there in 1 Timothy. Also we have here 2 Timothy 4.14. Alexander the coppersmith, pretty specific, that was his job, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. It doesn't say that what he did, but obviously he opposed the Apostle Paul in trying to do his ministry. And so he said, Lord, reward him according to his works. So another name mentioned, Alexander the coppersmith. And then in 3 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, I wrote unto the church, but Diophathries, okay, I can't say it now, <laughs> who loves to have preeminence. In other words, look at me, I'm first place. Among them receive us, received us not. Therefore, if I come, I will remember the deeds which he does, Pratting against us with malicious words and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids those who would and call, cast them out of the church. Basically, this guy was one of them dictators, okay? You know, my church, my highway or my way is basically who he was. He wanted to have preeminence. He was self-centered. He was absorbed. Anybody that tried to teach or say anything, he got threatened by, okay? So he wanted to have be the one main guy up there, and Paul... John said, hey, this guy's a trouble. We need to um, straighten this situation out. So the point here of this meme with false teachers, sometimes we have to name names. Sometimes we have to suppose false doctrine. You have to because you have to learn this stuff. And if you don't learn this stuff, you're susceptible to get trapped in it. You know, I went through my Christian years of the last almost 50 years, I've gone back and studied things. I've gone back. I've gone back. I've gone back because... You hear this stuff and you say, what in the world? i got to make sure, is what I believe true or is what they believe true? Go back and research it. If you search, research the scriptures daily, Acts 17 11, you can find out and confirm your faith and it just builds your faith stronger and stronger. And also go to other mature Christians that you can trust and you know and discuss with them and they'll help you also. But it's, we always have to stand in strong doctrine. That's the truth. Okay, so I think that's what I have all for my meme. Next we have a prophecy update. The seven-year covenant, we talk about before the, after the rapture, before the tribulation stop, starts, the Antichrist is going to sign a seven-year covenant with Israel, and that's going to be the beginning of the seven-year tribulation, okay? I'm not going to go into this real deep. This would take a whole service just to cover this, but I'm just going to show you this briefly. In Daniel 9, verse 25 through 27, it says, Know therefore and understand, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. Now, you read that and say, what does that mean? Well, the week there is the Hebrew word Shabuah, and it means a set of seven. It's like, when I say a dozen, how many eggs do you have? You have a dozen, you have 12, right? And same way here, weeks means a set of seven. So when it says here, going forth of the commandment to restore and build, rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, that's Jesus, shall be seven weeks, it's seven sevens, that's 49 years. And when you, you understand, so that means 49 years after they left Babylon, went back to Jerusalem and rebuilt Jerusalem, okay? And you read about that in what, Ezra, Nehemiah, and so on. They went back and rebuilt Jerusalem, it took them 49 years, okay? After, that was back in what, 600, 500, something BC, okay? I, can't, I don't remember all the dates, I always have to go back and study this. But my point is they went back and built Jerusalem, then it says three score and two weeks. You know what a score is? A score is 20, right? So three score is 60 and two. So 62 weeks. That is 62 times seven. That's 434 years until Messiah the Prince comes. That's when Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Now here's what's cool. From that date that they're 
was they said go, that, that he could actually go and rebuild Jerusalem again. They know that date, and I, I don't, I'm not going to go through that depth today, but from that date, you take these um, 49 years and these 434 years, which is 62 times 7, and added them together gives you 493 years. 493 years is 69 weeks, okay? And so from that date, you will come right exactly into the date that Jesus got on that donkey right before his crucifixion. It's, it's an actual amazing thing when you study this out. A guy named Sir Robert Anderson back, back was 100 years or so ago, studied this, and a guy named David Cooper also have some excellent information on this, and you can go through and you can study this. It's a little complex because you're looking at dates back, you know, that many years ago, but you can actually go through and find out from the point of when they were told that they could go and restore Jerusalem and the Jews were leaving Babylon to the point where Jesus Christ came in to go to the cross. It, it's right down to the date. It's absolutely fascinating and amazing. But anyways, so it, it, that's in verse 25. Verse 26 says, And after three score and two weeks until shall Messiah be cut off. So that's the, after the totally, total of um, the 69 weeks, if you add, the, add them together, the 493 years, Jesus will die, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who shall come, that Satan, shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood until the end of the war, war desolations are determined. Now, so that we, we refer to what's called 70 weeks, okay? Now, I want to go through this in more detail on, on one Thursday night sometime. But anyways, them 70 weeks, Israel was being punished because every seventh year they were supposed to leave their land and they were supposed to take their crops from the sixth year and put them in silos and not plant their gardens or their fields for the seventh year. But they still did it. They did that over and over and over again. And so after God says, okay, 70 times, then I'm going to take 7 times 70, 490 years, you're going to be punished. So that 483 years we just talked about, the 62 weeks plus the 7 weeks is the 69 weeks. There's one week left, right? When, when does this last week get fulfilled, this last week of seven? Right now we have the church age. Church age is like a parenthesis in between Israel until we start the tribulation, okay? When the tribulation starts with the signing of this covenant, that is starting the last one set of seven years for Israel, which takes you to that 490 years. Okay, now maybe I have you thoroughly confused. But anyways, um, and then so we look at verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay, so the Antichrist goes to Israel and says, hey, I'm going to give you a covenant to sign for one week for seven years. Now realize this, Israel, and this is today, most people in Israel are not saved, they're not Christians. We know during the tribulation, one third of the Jews will be saved according to Zechariah 13 verse 8. But it says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, which is one set of seven, which is seven years, and in the middle of the week, which is in the middle of seven years, it's three and a half years, that's when the Antichrist goes into the temple, declares himself as God, so the week he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The Jews are going to rebuild their temple, and they'll be sacrificing again. And for the overspreading of a domination, he shall make it desolate. In other words, they can't use a temple anymore. Jews all have to flee. And that Antichrist goes in there and calls himself God. And even until the consummation, consummation is the end of the tribulation, and that determined shall be poured out on a desolate. That word desolate means desolator poured out in the Antichrist. Antichrist will be destroyed by, at the end of all this. Okay, so here's a cool verse in Isaiah, okay? Isaiah 28, verse 15. This covenant they signed, they shouldn't have because they were signing a covenant, covenant that God did not want them to sign. This was unsaved Israel signing a covenant with the Antichrist. Antichrist, we're your buddy protect us. Now, a lot of the Jews don't want them to do that. But you see right now going on in Israel, there's a lot of trouble. And in fact, they're trying to get um, Netanyahu out of office and so on. And so here, Isaiah 28, verse 15, because you have said we have made a covenant with death, that covenant they made was a bad covenant. It was a covenant with death, and with hell are we in agreement. And signing a covenant with an antichrist is signing a covenant with hell. Uh, when the overflow and scourge shall pass through, in other words, they're going to be overrun. It shall not come out to us. They thought that covenant was going to protect them. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. So the Jews thought, we signed a covenant with this Antichrist, we're going to be safe. These 400 million um, Arab people that hate us, Islam, 
are not going to do anything to us because Antichrist is going to protect them. Who should they be asking for protection from, right? Obviously from God. So God was not happy with this, and he calls that a covenant with death and a covenant with hell. And so verse 18, And your covenant with death shall be disannulled. It shall be stopped. And your agreement with hell shall not stand. It's not going to do you any good. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. Israel is going to be overrun, okay? And that's during the midpoint of the tribulation when this all happens. The, you know that one-third of the Jewish people are going to escape to down to lower Jordan in Edom in a place called Petra, I believe, for safety. So, but this covenant is not going to do, work any good. So just to give you a little idea when we talk about covenants, the signing of covenant that Israel does, a little more uh, something to whet your appetite. And Someday we have to go the, through this in more detail. We have to get coffee, though, because some of this stuff, when you figure these numbers out and so, all that and so on and so on, it gets kind of rough. But I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just wanted to kind of a little bit of update on this. Okay. Our next one is going to be our apologetic, and it's going to be about trees. Now, do you think trees have a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship with each other? Like we, as parents, have a relationship with your children, right? And you know what? Trees have that type of relationship, too, and God built that in them. And that's, this is absolutely fascinating. So pay attention to this. We're going to be talking about trees. So as you're taking a walk through a beautiful forest like this, we're often looking at the trees, we're listening to the birds. But if you thought about what's happening under your feet, as you look at a forest, you'll often see mushrooms growing, the little mushroom heads. Those mushroom heads are literally like the fruit of an apple tree. They're the apple. The majority of the body and the life of a mushroom is happening under the ground. There are millions of little fibrous roots heading in every direction, intertwining in and around the tree roots called microcilium. Now, those are the, the body of the mushrooms and it's the stems it sends up are like the fruit or the apples hanging from a tree. But the amazing thing is the interconnection that we have even recently discovered between the trees themselves and those massive amounts of fungal roots that are happening and intertwining with the tree roots. The University of Reading in England recently did a study between huge spruce trees and the, the fungus that was intertwined with the roots of those trees. What they discovered was that the very large older trees had a network of roots that are intertwined with these fungal roots. And often in a large canopy forest, there would be young spruce trees located 10, 20, 50 feet or more from the main trees that were often struggling to survive and get nutrients and sunlight and not growing very well. This would send a signal to the larger, more mature trees through the fungal roots. Those trees would then send nutrients through the fungus to the other trees who would then draw those nutrients in order to survive amongst themselves. Now, why would there be this connection? Because about 20% of the nutrients and sugars from the tree would be used by the fungus who would then pass along the rest of the nutrients to the other trees. It's an incredible symbiotic, mutually beneficial partnership between fungus and trees. Without this mutually beneficial relationship, the young trees would not survive and not grow and not thrive. Without the nutrients, the fungus would not grow and thrive. They both needed each other. Now, only God could do that. Evolution, random changes, could not get two independent organisms to both develop a network of dependence upon one another. Who would have ever thought so much would be going on under our feet as we walk through a peaceful forest. And it all points to a magnificent creator who created it all, Jesus Christ, the creator. Isn't that cool? Any comments on that? I think that's fascinating to think about that. It's like the mousetrap. If you take one piece or part off the mousetrap, it's not going to work. But here, everything has to be intertwined at the very beginning for it to work. 
and it only can be through design. So God's got an incredible design. Evolution would not do this. It just doesn't interconnect things like this. So that was, that's pretty fascinating. Okay, we're on week 13. This is actually, I think we did 18 weeks in this study. We're going to talk about the crown of victory, which in 1 Corinthians 9.25 is actually the incorruptible crown. So we'll be looking at that tonight, and we'll be finishing up crowns here in just a second. But I want to do a little review like I did last week on the five crowns. Because you, we sometimes forget stuff, don't we? I sure do. <laughs> crown of righteousness was 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. We, we, if we love his appearing and stand for truth and live for him because we love his appearing, you can receive that crown of righteousness. The crown of life is in James chapter 1, verse 12, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Um, you may suffer, you may go through trials, don't give up, don't quit, keep fighting, keep standing for Christ, and hey, you can receive the crown of life. Then the third one there is the crown of joy. Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. They call this the soul winner's crown. I think it's more than just a soul winner's. I think it's basically we having an influence on our brothers and sisters in Christ you know, younger Christians especially. Now, you may have been instrumental in giving somebody a track or explaining the plan of salvation to them. They understood it. The Holy Spirit worked on their heart, and they trust that Christ is the Savior. So God used you to help that person to understand the gospel of salvation. So if you do that, you try to be a witness to people, God's going to give you that crown right there. But also, I think also as a young Christian, you influencing that young Christian to grow as a Christian, I think has some is important as far as this crown is also. Okay, so then we got the crown of glory we talked about last week. It was 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. And this is for those that are in leadership in a church. And it says, feed the flock, feed the flock, feed the church. Whether it's an adult Sunday school class, a junior church, a nursery, a Bible study at your home or at church or wherever, we are to feed the flock. So any leader in a church should be available to feed the flock meat, milk, and meat. There's nothing wrong with giving people milk because I like to get refreshed on some of the basics all the time. But the milk, you know, baby Christians need the milk so they can grow. Then they get fed the meat. But here's the problem. I know Chris and I been, went to a church um, in Lafayette, and we went to the adult Sunday school class, and we thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> it was like it had nothing to do with the Bible. And we were just amazed that there's people that sit there in these classes. But people are just become blinded so much, and they really don't even look for the uh, milk and the meat. They get fed cotton candy. They get fed fruit punch. And they think that's okay. And that's, that's, but that doesn't do any good. It gives you poor, poor biblical health, right? We need milk and meat. So the crown of glory there is leaders leading the people that are under their um, influence, be either a class or a group or whatever it is, and you can receive that crown of glory. So tonight we're going to talk about the crown of victory in 1 Corinthians 9.25. This is referred to as the incorruptible crown. Uh, it's basically your focus, your intention. You know how you're, how you're going to live your life. You, you have a plan of how you're going to do what you want to do as a Christian. But understand this. Some people say there's five crowns. Many people say there's four crowns, righteous life, joy, glory, and the crown of victory basically just refers to the other four. And I, I kind of lean that way now the more I study this, okay? But we'll see that in just a second. So as we know, this, now this crown is called the Stephanus. It's the wreath or garland which is given as a prize to victors in public games, okay? It was like intertwined as you can see in the picture up here, right? So that's called the Stephanus, not the crown with the points on it like a king would get, the diadem, Okay? And then, so it also can look like this, possibly like this, maybe not the full 360 degrees. So there's different ways that this Stephanus crown could look. Okay, and as I mentioned there, the eternal blessedness, which will be given as a prize to the genuine servants of God in Christ, the crown or the wreath, which is the reward of the righteous. Now, these crowns, they're a physical symbol of your receiving a prize because of your eternal, your eternal blessedness you receive. So I believe the crown's a symbol, but it's a symbol that everybody can see. I believe they're real because last week I mentioned Revelation 4, 10, it says they cast them crowns at the throne of Christ, okay? So I believe they're literal real crowns, and I believe that you keep them 
at least through the uh, thousand year millennial kingdom. Okay, so um, as I mentioned in Revelation 4.10, we cast them at the throne. So let's go ahead and look at this crown here. 1 Corinthians 9.25, the incorruptible crown. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Every man that strives, now you know that word strives, what word we get from that? Agonize. That's where we get our English word agonize. Every man that goes through the agony, that strives for mastery to win, is temperate. They're under self-control in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Tonight the NFL draft is on. My sons are all excited about it. And, you know, they're going to bring in these players and they're going to vote, uh, pick this one, pick that one, pick that one, and so on and so on. And it's going to make their team better. But you know what? No matter who these people are, they become superstars, you know, for the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, they become an announcer, whatever. It's all going to go down eventually. It's corruptible. It's not going to last. You know, it's fun for the time for us to receive our different things that we get, you know, get promotions at work. You may get a pay raise at work and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. But look at it in the perspective that this is going to fade away. It's corruptible. We need to pursue the incorruptible crown, which will last forever. And so this verse here, I think when you read this, I think it's referring to you have to be temperate to, re to earn what's required for each of the previous four crowns that we mentioned. Whether there's an incorruptible crown, when we get to heaven, we can say, hey, hey, there is an incorruptible crown. I don't know for sure. Or does it refer to um, being temperate to earn the other four crowns that are mentioned that we saw so far? I don't know that 100% for sure. But I, I kind of lean toward the idea, I believe that this verse refers to the previous four crowns, which are the crowns of righteousness and life and rejoicing and glory, okay? So 1 Corinthians 9.25, which we just read, every man that strives for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. So why are we temperate? Why do we make sure that we do what we do as Christians, that we do we stand strong? Because we do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. One of these crowns we're trying to strive in forward. Now, I don't, I don't go up in the morning and say, I'm going to try to earn that crown of rejoicing today. No, you try to be the best you can for Christ and look at it from an eternal perspective. And so what 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, you, number one, you have to be temperate in all things, in all your life. Just like an athlete, hey, they're going to eat right, they're going to exercise, they're going to get plenty of sleep, they're going to do all this stuff to try to be all they could be, right? They, they sacrificed their life and everything else to be dedicated to their cause. Now, it says they're temperate in all things, but that's for us too as Christians. We need to do that for ourselves, temperate in all things. Number two, it says we need to be temperate in all things, okay? That's the point of 1 Corinthians 9.25. The third point, be temperate in all things. Get that in. Get the, realize that. 1 Corinthians 9.25, be temperate. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, which is going to perish, but we in an incorruptible crown that would never be destroyed. Remember back, it's back in Matthew when it says, put your, save your treasures in heaven that's going to last and not perish. Okay, this is the same idea here with this crown. So let me explain a little bit what that word um, temperate means here. On the blue letter Bible, in Greek it means to be self-controlled, continent, to exhibit self-government conduct oneself temperately. In a figure drawn from athletes who had preparing themselves for the games, abstained from unwholesome food, food, wine, and sexual indulgence. So basically you can put you get yourself under control for Christ, just like an athlete would do. And then in a, I think this is vines. N, which is in and kratos, it means in power or in strength. Uh, to have power over oneself, you know, to get yourself under the control. Do you notice that when you're tired and so on and you, <laughs> you kind of lose control? That's when I tend to eat too much, okay? And I, it's, it's just, we, we just have to stay under control. Power over oneself. If they have not con continency, are lacking in self-control, cannot contain, is temperate. So the whole idea is be temperate in all things. And to do that, we attain an incorruptible crown, and that's, those who lived a disciplined life. We discipline ourselves for a purpose, right? And it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's hard to do this, but that's something we should do. 
Now I'm going to look at a verse here real quick, and it's 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And if you, if you want to look at it yourself, I won't have it on the screen, but 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. And it says this. This is how a pastor in a church or a teacher preached the word. Preach the what? Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. In other words, you may not be feeling good. You may feel good. There's, you may have things in your mind. Do it anyways. Be in season, out season. Reprove, rebuke. Really? Reprove, rebuke? You're not going to get a large church if you're reproving and rebuking people. But the Bible says do it. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Encourage people to grow, to do that, well, everything they can to be temperate. With all long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine. People hate doctrine. The Bible says teach doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. Let me read the, actually the, in context here, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Verse 1, Paul said to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. We know that, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, right? We talked about that verse. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Preach, be word, preach the word, be instead in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, tell me what I want to hear. That's what that verse means. Verse 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Okay? And then verse 5, but watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of the ministry. In other words, Make your ministry serious because it is serious. Make full proof. So um, 2 Timothy 4, verse 1 through 5 is what a pastor should do, and that's what leaders in a church should do, teachers, and so on, right? Okay. Let's go ahead and look at our next one here. This is a biblical doctrine that I'm teaching, the doctrine of the Bema Seat of Christ, the doctrine of rewards. You don't hear this too often taught. It's a doctrine of the BBC of Christ. That is a doctrine. That's a teaching in the Bible. Now we've been through these, whatever, 18 weeks or whatever we've gone through this, these 13 lessons. Now I th think we've all learned something, right? Little by little you add this on and you understand that what you did not know before about rewards, crowns, God going to give you the rewards. You could be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ because you're not serving him. And so on and so on. A lot of that stuff people don't know and don't understand. But it's good to know, isn't it? It's good to say, hey, you told me I'm going to have a test at the end. I can prepare for that test even if I don't start until right now. Now, I know you guys have all been serving Christ for a long time. And even though you may not have been thinking I've been, I'm going to earn rewards or this and that, you will by being faithful and being temperate in all things. So here... This is what Joe Wall says in the book that, one of the main books that I'm using for this study, his book, Going for the Gold, he says this, this is a quote. There are eternal repercussions or effects in all that the believer thinks, says, and does. So what you think, say, and do is important. It is only for that Christian to be made aware of, it is, and it is only fair that that Christian be made aware of these repercussions before it is too late. For them to change the way they live. So what Joe is saying there, it's important for you to know this stuff. Because when you get to heaven, wouldn't you say, oh, I didn't know that, nobody ever told me this. That it was important for how I live my life. And it is important. The Bible tells us that for that reason. So here's something to ask yourself. In your life as a Christian, have you ever seriously considered this? In your life as a Christian, have you ever considered this? Because sometimes we may look at that Christian, well, he's doing something, look at he's amazing, this and that. But look at, look at this. The victorious life is not always the life that everyone notices. The life that receives praises. Or the life that looks great to everyone around him. Sometimes you think, well, that guy's going to get rewards. He goes out and passes out tracks. That guy's going to get rewards. He never misses a church service. That guy's going to get rewards because he always gives money to church and does this and that, right? Now that's what we think. But it says here, it's not the one that you notice. The life that receives praise or the life that looks great to everyone around them, it is the Christian life that is temperate in all things. You maintain yourself. You keep yourself under control. You keep serving. You know, you may not be that shining star that everybody looks at and thinks, oh, they're doing such things. You may be the one that goes home and gets on your knees 
on bed, your bed be at night and praise and has your devotions in the morning, calls your friends or, or any different ways that you can use social media to be a witness with Bible verses or, or so on and so on. And you may be doing a lot more than some of these other people that are standing up in front of people or that you think are the ones that are doing so great. Remember that. Don't downplay what you're doing. Just keep doing it faithfully and being temperate. So th that is exciting, I think. So let's compare these two lives. The unprofitable life, the triumphant life. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to tell you, right, these both are saved. Many people in Christianity will say that person is not a Christian because of what they're doing. No. Now, we, you don't add works to salvation. I don't care how you do it, front load, back load, whatever. Salvation is by grace from the second you're saved all the way to the end. You're preserved by Christ, by him alone. If it was up to us, we would definitely fail. And this unprofitable life is someone that did not live, live, for, live for Christ, okay? So let's look at the unprofitable life. They have an eternal home in heaven. They're going to go to heaven someday. Christ is preparing a place for them. They may have regret at the beam of seat of Christ. They may say, well, I wish I would have did more. Don't you always have regret? Well, I wish I was a better child than my mom and dad. I wish I was better parents to my children. We all have regrets, right? But hey, here's something that we could have regrets before Christ because we didn't serve him like we should. Um, then, ashamed at the beam of seat. It tells us uh, in, is it 1 John 2.8, that you could be ashamed at the beam of seat of Christ. Uh, we've lived a self-centered life. It's all about me, me, me. Lived a carnal life of feeding the flesh. You know, it's just, I just take care of myself. I make myself feel good and happy. I don't really care about anybody else, or I don't care what I do for Christ. Conform to the world standards. In other words, I'm, I look just like the world. I say, dress the same way. I act the same way. I talk the same way. If you're a duck, you look like a duck. Okay. Not an overcomer. They don't overcome anything. They don't even try. Uh, they will receive no well done from Christ. They could be a rebellious servant. Now, there's different degrees of how we rebel, right? Different stages and things in our life, we would get rebellious. Live for the here and now. What's, what's important is right here and now. I've got my million dollars in the bank. I'm secure, and I'm, that's going to take care of me until the day I die. Well, what about looking forward? And then live for self-satisfaction. Everything that pleases you to satisfy you loves the things of the world. Now, before I go on to the triumphant life, I want to look at a verse in Psalm 68, 18. And I just looked, found this verse. I thought this was pretty cool. Psalm 68, verse 18. So if you want to flip there, or you could just listen, and I'll read it to you. Um, this actual verse is repeated in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. And it's talking about when Christ died, he went down into um, Hades paradise where all the saved people People were and brought them up to heaven, to the true paradise in heaven, okay? That's repeated in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. But let's look at Psalm 68, verse 18. That Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yeah, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Notice this here, receive gifts for men. Uh, Revelation 22, verse 12 says he's going to give rewards to to Christians, but here it says, for the rebellious also. So even a rebellious person at times is going to get some, could get some rewards, okay? I mean, it's hard to believe that somebody go through their whole life and be unprofitable completely. I guess it is possible, and it could be done because your salvation is in Christ, not in yourself. But I thought that was interesting that even those that don't, aren't perfect, which none of us are, are going to receive some gifts and rewards. That's how gracious and loving our, our Savior is. And I thought that was kind of neat to see that. But that's no excuse for not giving all you can because we can be ashamed. I mean, you, you want to do the best you can. So the triumphant life. They receive a great inheritance in heaven. They experience the fullness of eternal life. I mean, in other words, there's more to it than just being there. There's, hey, I've done all, my, all I can for Christ, and you're there. You're confident at the beam of seat of Christ. You know, Lord... I know I'm going to take my hits for the things I should have did better and didn't do, but at least you know you did what you could do for Christ. Um, a life of sacrifice for Christ. Lived a spirit-filled life. Conformed to the image of Christ. You were an overcomer. Receives well done from Christ. You're a faithful servant. Bring honor to the cause of Christ. Live for eternity. 
you will reign with Christ. We see that in Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 5, 10, and Revelation 20, verse 6, that we will be like priests and reign with Christ in heaven. So, is this saying that you're perfect? No. Is anybody ever going to be perfect? Absolutely not. Even Paul struggled, didn't he? Many, many times. So, you do what you can do for Christ and try to be the best you can. So, let me talk about being a true servant. You jump all in. You walk by faith for Christ and give you a little story that's kind of cute here. And I'm going to try to read this without bringing tears to my eyes. Okay, There's a lady named Alice Gray. And if you go on um, Amazon, you can look her up. She's written some Christian books and she's got a bunch of different stories. And it's kind of cool, cool little stories. But there's this story called The Little Girl with Pearls. It's also called The Treasure. And let me read this to you. The cheerful girl with bouncy golden curls was almost five. Waiting with her mother at the checkout stand, she saw them. A circle of glistening white pearls in a pink foil box. Oh, please, Mommy, can I have them? Please, Mommy, please. Quickly, the mother checked the back of the little box and then looked back into the pleading blue eyes of her little girl's upturned face. $1.95? That's almost $2. If you really want them, you can save enough money to buy them for yourself. Your birthday's only a week away, and you might get another Chris doll Chris dollar from Grandma. Grandma will probably give a lot more than that, right? <laughs> Anyways, as soon as Jenny got home, she emptied her penny bank and counted out 17 pennies. After dinner, she did more than her share of chores, and she went to the neighbor and asked Mrs. Ma James if she could pick dandelions for 10 cents on her birth uh, for 10 cents. On her birthday, Grandma did give her another new dollar bill. And at last, she had enough money to buy the necklace. Jenny loved pearls. They made her feel dressed up and grown up. She wore them everywhere, Sunday school, kindergarten, even to bed. The only time that she took them off was when she went swimming or had a bubble bath. Mother said if they got wet, they might turn her neck green. Jenny had a very loving daddy, and every night when she was ready for bed, he would stop whatever he was doing and come upstairs to read her a story. One night when he finished the story, he asked Jenny, do you love me? Oh, yes, Daddy, you know that I love you. Then give me your pearls. Oh, Daddy, not my pearls. But you can have Princess, the white horse from my collection, the one with the pink tail. Remember, Daddy, the one you gave me. She's my favorite. That's okay, honey. Daddy loves you. Good night. And he brushed her cheek with a kiss. About a week later, after the story time, Jenny's daddy asked again, Do you love me? Daddy, you know I love you. Then give me your pearls. Oh, Daddy, not my pearls, but you can have my baby doll, the brand new one I got for my birthday. She is so beautiful, and you can have the yellow blanket that matches her sleeper. That's okay. Sleep well. God bless you, little one. Daddy loves you. And as always, he brushed her cheek with a gentle kiss. A few nights, a few nights later, when her daddy came in, Jenny was sitting on her bed with her legs crossed Indian style. As he came close, he noticed her, Chin was trembling, and one silent tear rolled down her cheek. What is it, Jenny? What's the matter? Jenny didn't say anything, but lifted her little hand, hand up to her daddy, and when he opened it, there was her little pearl necklace. With a little quiver, she finally said, Here, Daddy, it's for you. With tears gathering in his own eyes, Jenny's kind daddy reached out with one hand to take the dime store necklace, with the other hand, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a blue velvet case with a st strand of genuine pearls and gave them to Jenny. He had had them all the time. He was just waiting for her to give up the dime store stuff so he could give her the genuine treasure. Now, isn't that a cute story? To think that to her, this little pearls were so important, but her father all along had something worth in way more. And I think you, you know how to correlate this with... God our Father. He has so much for us, we just have to give up what we think is so important right now for Him. Um, in the Old Testament, they used to take it, they put a, uh, in the person's ear, they would, uh, an awl, and they would bore their ear with it, and they would be a bondservant with that person for the rest of their life. And it's kind of a picture of us when we um, dedicate our life to be a servant for Christ. But Ezekiel, or not Ezekiel, Exodus 21.6 says, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or onto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. 
Okay, so, and it says in another verse here in Deuteronomy uh, 15, 7, that you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. So a slave would say, hey, I don't want to be set free. I want to be your servant forever. You and I are bond servants to Christ, and we're not going to have an awl driven through our ears, literally, but figuratively, you know, we have, need to dedicate our Christ our life to Christ the same. In fact, Luke 12, 37 tells us this. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to set down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Christ is going to be there with us and close to us in heaven if we look for his return and we're excited about it. Uh, being a servant, you say, in these last days, is it really safe? I mean, don't you realize that persecution is going to get worse and worse? Maybe I should go hide in my closet and put my Bibles away and not do these things that are going to point me out to other people that are going to persecute me. You know what? That's a mistake. We need to stand for Christ no matter what. So look at this. This is what the world thinks. Build a bunker outside your house to go hide in and be protected. Now, is that going to protect you from a nuclear blast, that one? I don't think so. And people say, well, I'm going to come out of this bunker after some time, and I'm going to be one of the few left on this world. And, you know, the nuclear radiation is not going to affect me, right? But anyways, what a miserable thought, right? So you come out, you live another 10 years, you live another 20 years, you live another 30 years. It's like that. That is not going to protect you in these last days. And yet there's people in this world doing this, and they're going to pay the price for it. I'm, it, it really is kind of dumb, isn't it? But Don Hillis, Dr. Don Hillis, this was at a Bible camp, he says this, the safest place in the world is the center of God's will. The man of God is indestructible until God's will for his life is finished. Even when I was in the hospital, and he told me that I had sepsis, it's not really sepsis I had, if I would have let it go and I would have went to the hospital, it could have been. I had a friend of mine in high school, my grade, that died last year because of sepsis. Basically an infection, right? But this was an infection that I had. It could have gotten worse and worse. And it was interesting what this one doctor told us. And Tony, you may think this is kind of interesting. He said that they call everything sepsis now, all fact infections. Because if they do that, they get more money, you know, for their... For their uh, for their hospital. <laughs> I thought that was funny. So they labeled me as having sepsis, which I really didn't. I could have if I wouldn't have taken care of it and got the antibiotics. But anyways, um, I thought that was interesting when you think about You know what? God didn't take me home yet. And you've all gone so through some health things too, and God has not taken you home yet. He has a purpose for us here still. We still have time left to serve him and do things for him. So remember that. Um, Arnold. Arnold Schwarzenegger believes heaven is a fantasy. Says he won't, we won't see each other again after we're gone. I'm sorry, Arnold. You may have did, lived your life and became a governor, or a top bodybuilder, and so on, and received all this fame. You're going to find out that heaven and hell are re real. And it's, you're not going to say, hasta la vista, baby, right? <laughs> he's, he's, he's going to understand that. Now, doesn't that kind of make you sad when you think about that? Because if you any, even look into it, you understand there is a heaven and a hell, and it's real and it's true, and we need to understand that. To be safe, you have to be in the will of God. And so, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, will end with this verse, then a verse in Titus chapter 2, but it says, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be your transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, clean your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Get rid of them old pearls in the dime store and get the pearls of great price that God's going to give you. It's the most amazing thing. So I'm going to look at two more verses real quick, then we'll be done. But I want to look at Ezekiel 33, 11. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. It says this, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God does not have pleasure in a guy like an Arnold Schwarzenegger that's going to die without Christ. He doesn't have pleasure in that. He, doesn't, he, he came to die for everybody. 
while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He gave his life for everybody in the whole world. For God so loved the world. Say unto them as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live, live, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? So we're speaking of Israel. But it's so true for any one of us that doesn't know Christ. God wants you to get saved. In fact, it's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He came and died for the whole world. He, he gave his life for everybody. And so remember that. So let me close with Titus chapter 2, 13. And it says this. Looking for that blessed hope. That's Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope. And that's our true hope, isn't it? And for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's keep looking and staying strong. And God will reward you as you earn rewards. And that's so important. Let me read verse 12, the verse before that, because this is kind of something that is important. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly, worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Right now, we should be living. And actually, this, this verse 13 is what's called in the present tense. Right now, we should be looking for the return of Christ. He could have came back in the first century, but you know what? He's going to come before that tribulation time period, before that uh, covenant sign, and we'll be taken out of here. And it's exciting to think of that, but let's give it everything we can for him right now. Okay, that's all I have for my message tonight. Mm -hmm.